Musculoskeletal disorders are common in clinical practice. The musculoskeletal system is complex, and learning how to evaluate patients with rheumatic conditions can be intimidating for the novice and expert alike. The GALS is a screening musculoskeletal exam first introduced by Doherty in 1992. GALS stands for gait, arms, legs, and spine. The GALS examination is sufficiently simple and quick that it can be used in all patients. A pediatric GALS screening exam was recently introduced by Foster. It includes three additional features to capture abnormalities commonly seen in children. These are Ask the patient to raise their arms overhead. Ask the patient to walk on their heels and toes. Ask the patient to place three of their fingers in their mouth. There are three components to the GALS examination. Three questions which are added to the general functional inquiry the screening examination itself, a simple method of recording the findings in a chart. As part of the general functional inquiry, three simple questions are asked of the child or the child's parents. Does your child have any stiffness or pain in his or her muscles, joints, or back? Can your child dress completely without any difficulty? Can your child walk up and down stairs without any difficulty? There are three positions for the examination. Walking, standing with inspection at the back, side, and front, supine. The order for the physical examination is not important and should be easily incorporated within your usual screening examination. The patient is asked to walk. The gait is inspected for symmetry, smoothness of movement, stride length, mechanics, and the ability to turn. Ask the patient to walk on their heels, and then again on their toes. In pediatric patients, the inability to walk on heels may be indicative of tight heel cords from cerebral palsy. The patient is then inspected from behind. Are the iliac crests at the same height? If the spinal dimples are level, then there is no significant leg length discrepancy. Is there evidence of scoliosis? Are the paraspinal muscles normal? Is there normal symmetrical muscle bulk of the shoulders, buttocks, thighs, and calves? Is there popliteal swelling or hind foot swelling or deformity? The patient is then inspected from the side. Is there a normal cervical and lumbar lardosis as well as a normal thoracic kyphosis? Ask the patient to touch their toes and observe if there is a normal lumbosacral rhythm that is a smooth transition from lumbar lordosis to kyphosis. Loss of lumbar lordosis associated with back pain is uncommon in children and should be a red flag for back pathology. With regards to movement of cervical spine, ask the patient then to extend their head as far backwards as possible. In pediatric patients, cervical spine extension is the earliest sign of cervical spine pathology. The patient is inspected from the front. With regard to range of motion in the cervical spine, ask the patient to put their ear against their shoulder on either side. Ask the patient to put their arms overhead, with palms facing each other. If there is arthritis affecting one shoulder, the child tilts the head toward the abnormal side to minimize the limitation of shoulder motion. Ask the patient to put their hands behind their head with their elbows back to check for external rotation. Can the patient hold their hands by their sides with their elbows straight? Ask the patient to put their arms by their sides with their hands in front and palms down. Observe the nails for any pitting and periungal areas for erythema. Can the patient turn their hands over? Ask the patient to oppose their thumb to each of their fingers in sequence. Ask the patient to make a fist. Then squeeze metacarpals two through five to see if there is any metacarpophalangeal tenderness. Do this gently and watch the child's face as this can result in severe pain if metacarpophalangeal joints are inflamed. Ask the patient to put their hands back to back. Ask the patient to put their hands together. Ask the patient to place three fingers into their mouth. The normal mouth opening should allow three of a child's own fingers to fit in vertically. In a growing child, Arthritis in temporomandibular joints may result in impaired mandibular growth. 
While the patient is supine on the bed, after you have finished examining the heart, lungs, and abdomen, feel for any knee warmth. Warmth can be detected with either the palm or the back of the hand. The knee is typically cooler than the surrounding tissue. While you are doing that, feel for any knee crepitus. Press on the patella to see if there is any patellofemoral tenderness or swelling in the knee joint. Elicit the bulge sign by milking fluid out of the medial recess into the suprapatellar pouch, and then stroke the lateral recess in a downward direction with the back of your hand to move the fluid back. Inspect the knee for obvious swelling, redness, or evidence of injury. Suspect joint effusion if the normal concavity along the medial side of the patella is lost. Please note hand position when testing knee flexion. A hand is kept under the knee joint to prevent accidentally pressing on a painful joint. An important sign of hip disease is produced when the hip is noted to rotate externally instead of flexing in a straight line as it is flexed from the extended position to flexed position. Squeeze the distal metatarsal joints 2 through 5 to see if there is any metatarsal phalangeal tenderness. Look at the child's face, as the child may be too young to verbalize pain. Grimace is a positive sign. Inspect the soles of the feet for calluses. In order to record the results of the examination, a simplified chart is used. As in this example, the abnormalities are recorded with an X, and then expanded on below the chart.